welcome to the Star of Brian. So usually we like to start off with a little bit of personal information. Okay. <laughs> no. Are you are you Swiss? Where do you come from? I'm Swiss, born in Rapperswil, and not too far. Mm -hmm. um, this is where I also studied computer science yeah. at the Hochschule Rapperswil. Then after the studies, I moved to Silicon Valley. Mm. Actually. 2001 till seven I was there for six years. Did my I worked as a software engineer and did my first startup attempt. Actually, testing time is my third one. Right, right. For the first successful one so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a great time. I could sell. It was called Accelerate, and I could sell the startup to another startup which got way more funding than I, and uh, but I kind of knew it was in the space of uh, online spreadsheets, and back then Google started to do their own spreadsheets, and I knew this is going to be the end, I have not the power to go very far, and so I kind of found this other startup which thought they can still do it, and said, yeah, yeah, you will be able to do it, and I sold the assets and everything. And it was kind of, it wasn't a big exit, but it was like a, a null something what I invested. I got back, mm -hmm. moved back to Switzerland, and I was kind of lost. I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? Um, people usually expect when you go to the States, you come back very rich. I <laughs> went with two suitcases, I came back with three suitcases, and, um, and then I kind of had to do some reflection on myself, and discovered back then Doodle, and it was still like very sort of the beginning, um, and it also looked ugly back then, and I checked the uh, Alexa ranks, and it was kind of interesting how the thing really picked up, mm -hmm. and then I was like, okay, there's maybe an opportunity for me to get the next adventure mm -hmm. to kind of join them, and People knew it, even in my family, they knew it, I thought, okay, there's something in it. So I contacted back then um, Mike Paul, and after a few months, I was their first employee, and got, yeah, as PM, was like their product manager, and stayed there until the exit. So you started off as a developer, so you're actually a developer, a programmer, and you migrated into the usability side, or actually, well, I, I told them Mike and Paul, I don't want to code anymore. I'm really right. fed up with it. Um, and he said, Yeah, yeah, you can do product management. And I, I remember the first day, he basically said, install like um, this. Uh, what was it called? Java and um, development environments. Like no way. It's like my first day. You want to make me code? But yeah. I had to do some coding. But I grew pretty quick into the uh, product manager role and then I started to develop passion because what I liked about Duden was the ease of use and I started to do my first user testing things and I really got very passionate about getting end users and getting them to understand what, what are their desires, what are their pain points, what, what, what do, how do they work. So I organized a lot of user tests. And I got so passionate about it, I studied um, human-computer interaction design on the side, mm -hmm. and really started to kind of professionalize those skills. And then the exit came to Tomedia after three and a half years, and then we moved to Tomedia, and then it was kind of, my job was done. It's like, okay, now there's not much I can learn. And then I moved on and was a freelancer, like a UX design freelancer. Mm -hmm. This is where I discovered the idea of the testing time. Okay. So just to backtrack a little bit, when you were when you were younger, when you were still in school, or for example, did your parents uh, did you have some kind of influence that uh, you think today 
uh, led you to think, or even when you were younger, to think that you always wanted to be your own boss uh, from, from your family or as a child? Did you already have that entrepreneur bug in you, or did that develop later? Um, well, my whole family, my brothers, they're all sort of self-employed. Mm -hmm. I grew up on a farm with cows and <laughs> pigs and everything. So my dad was sort of an entrepreneur, but my mom was always scared to like go to a big company and the, the classic, <laughs> yeah, traditional thing. What I always had was like um, I always had ideas. Um, I remember I wanted. When I was young, I wanted to develop an anti-snoring device because um, <laughs> my mom and my dad they couldn't sleep together anymore because they were snoring each other <laughs> awake one night. And then I knew from my studies in physics, if you kind of send out the opposite wave, you can cancel out. <laughs> you know this from noise canceler headsets or... Um, and that was sort of my first idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never executed on yeah. it. So. <laughs> you should. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still a need. And so, um, but before you, you started testing time, you had another, another startup venture. It's actually, I think, the first time that we met. That was a remembered name. That was my second. Yeah. Actually, we had an interview together, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was right after we moved. I kind of wanted to leave that part out. <laughs> <laughs> But it taught me a lot. Um, I kind of got hooked on building something for the masses. And I thought like, well, people always forget names like here tonight. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, right, um, Nancy, no, uh, what's your name again? And it's like, I wanted to fix the problem on a big scale. And I got together with a memory trainer and I tried many um, kind of approaches. And never really took off. It's like I just realized one thing I was like a single founder, nobody wanted to join me. <laughs> they always said, like, yeah, that's a great idea, but nah. And um, <laughs> so I still kept, I was persistent and I kept going. And then I learned what the true reason was. It's like for. People, it's like a, in a Maslow pyramid, it's very high up, remembering them. It's like a luxury. If you manage the skills, it's good, but it's not like necessary, like food, a roof, and, and everything. So, and, and also, people didn't want to talk about weaknesses, so the word of mouth never took off. If people want to say, I'm so bad with names, I found this great app, people right. don't talk about these things. And so, I gave up. And sort of in parallel, I discovered in testing time, which is quite the opposite. So what's what's the tagline for testing time? Or what's what's the elevator pitch? What's what's the mini elevator pitch? Mini elevator. Well, the tagline is we recruit test users for UX designers and market researchers. And you do that with uh, uh, freelancers. No, this, what we do is we build. Now we're approaching 100,000 people in our database. What we want to achieve is like a representative pool of, of people. Regular people. Like across the entire Switzerland, Germany, all Europe, mm -hmm. and eventually all around the world. And by representative, I mean like not just like students, um, also like pilots, doctors, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, across all ages, all education levels, so basically a snapshot of country. And what's what's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? Well, there are many, but <laughs> <laughs> currently, um, for me personally, it's you're doing a Series A round. It's like uh, for me, it's the, the hardest thing I've ever done. It was like, we did like a first round in 2015, when we talked with Penny, so. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't a good fit back then. It was already hard to, to get someone excited mm -hmm. two years back. And then we partnered up with Investeer. They were really, they're still great, great people. And now it's a bigger game. Um, we want to get some, ideally, 
that like an investor or a bigger ticket is taken by an international um, VC. Mm -hmm. And so I'm talking like to investors all around Europe and, uh, and you get turned down a lot. It's all still like normal, but you need to really develop a thick skin. It's like dating, you know, like <laughs> dating, they always say, nah, you're too small, you're too tall. <laughs> and it goes on and on and you start to develop your game, you know, and you, you kind of analyze, you pull in people like, um, can you listen to the to the conversation in the back and tell me if I was good or not, and so yeah, you fight through it. Right. So that's my personal challenge. Then, like, the business itself really works great. I mean, we have such great growth over the past year. I mean, if you compare to 2015, when we made like 250,000 revenue, now we are going towards 1.5 million, like within two to three years, we six-folded uh, revenue, and especially the international business, and we generate 40% of revenue from outside Switzerland. And this is really something like a lot of Swiss startups, I think, forget or they don't do it. And we had like from the very beginning this international mindset that for us it shouldn't matter if you talk to someone from Germany, from the UK, or from Switzerland, I mean, it's, um, it shouldn't matter where the customer comes from, where the test users come from, it's always the same thing. We want to provide an excellent service. Mm -hmm. And so with this mindset, we established really growth all across Europe. Right. And what other challenges do we have? I guess building a great team is always hard find the right mix to find some of the team is here. <laughs> so, um, what's, what's something, what's a, a skill that uh, is usually, uh, or an underappreciated skill that you value? Um, to have the entrepreneurial mindset. Like, I know um, non-founders that don't have the same skin in the game, but they have to have the same passion, right. um, and and it's like you can approach a job and you do the job, do it right, or you can always think one step further, like what what what's am I along the vision of the company, and so like if people are very like pushy, this regards like challenge things, I really like that. That's, that's, uh, how many how many employees are do you have now? We are now eleven. We just hired someone from Germany. It's our first non-Swiss. Mm -hmm. Actually, because of like employment, <laughs> employ. Well, yeah, Nick is also from from Greece. Um, <laughs> but <the> worst <laughs> thing, <laughs> no. <laughs> What I tried to say is... Don't, don't tell anyone, right? <laughs> <laughs> the first who doesn't work okay. at our base in Zurich. Yeah. And we hired him because you cannot hire someone outside Switzerland mm -hmm. that easily. So we hired him as a full-time freelancer and just started. Yeah. Um, and how, how have you... So after you've gone past the first two or three employees, as you start getting more people on the team, you want to keep that culture, that vision alive, and I mean, you're still a small team, but mm -hmm. soon you're going to be 20, 30, 50, 100. How do you keep the, the passion and the culture alive as you grow your team? It's a very good question, and it's also kind of hard to answer. Um, we do like, as one thing, we celebrate things. So I guess our biggest celebrations now we go all together to um, Vienna because we achieved some milestones and this will be part um, team shaping and celebration mm -hmm. and we are shaping the culture um, I've never done this so I also rely on a lot of feedback from the people in the team like what would you do um, I guess 
talk a lot with each other, <laughs> exchange a lot, and listen, learn. Um, don't see yourself as a boss or anything, just see yourself as part of the team and yeah, you lead in a way the vision, but just make everyone feels comfortable and can work on things they're passionate about. And I guess we also have a DNA. Every new one who joins has to sign a DNA sheet where we say like what who we are, what is important to us. And so basically, that's sort of the, uh, your mantra, and your yeah, your goal, and your yes. Thanks. Everyone signed the vision. This kind of things sound cheesy, but <laughs> it's kind of good to keep people aligned. Mm -hmm. So maybe switching back a little bit to uh, more practical elements. Um, a lot of people here are founders and uh, involved in one way or another in online products and. Um, as we all know, your product and your your visual or your interaction is what makes you live or die. Do you have any um, quick tips or or, or something, some key elements that uh, to share when it comes to uh, usability, uh, user experience? Uh, Best design practices. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is this is probably a three-hour topic, but yeah. what's the thirty-second answer? What's yeah. the first thing that comes to mind, or the um, biggest mistake you see Swiss startups making? They don't do it lean. I guess um, we kind of proved when we started that you don't need a lot um, to prove you have a business. I mean, basically. I talked about this in like lean startup um, presentations. When we started, it was all fake. We pretended to have twenty thousand people. We had no. We, we built the website for eighty dollars. Our order form was like a survey tool, kind of made look like an order form, and we didn't have a single person in our pool. But we, we pretended to have twenty thousand. So. <laughs> we could have we could have built everything on that. I see this still a lot like in, in, in startups. They get so excited, like, oh let's develop this. Now we soon gonna release our great new platform and it always has like AI and machine learning and everything in it. <laughs> and I was like, well have you really do you have a proof that anyone cares? Because by default nobody gives a shit, you know what you do. And then um, and it's true, nobody really cares what you do. And so what I recommend is to learn very early on without developing too much. Does anyone pay you? Does anyone pull a credit card? Does, do, do users, and there are two currency, either user traction or if you're in a B2B space like us, do people pay for what you do? Yeah. So. Very true. And you can use <laughs> our service to... <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's, that's another question that I have. So um, I guess, are you, do you come in at, so there's two questions, do you come at more an MVP play a stage a little bit further along, or are you, are you uh, able to support in the whole journey? And the second question is, can startups afford you? Can startups? Can startups afford you? Or um, is that not your target? Like, initially, when we started, I believe especially startups are our customers, and they are unfortunately not because even if it's like 300 euros, startups still believe this is too expensive and I know better. Um, no offense, but it's sort of the mindset um, I experience. So our actually best customers are like um, Zalando's or the Zalando, which has a huge user experience team and they want to be the, the world's most user-friendly online shop and so this is part of their culture and they invest so much in user experience Salando orders people through our platform on a several times a week mm -hmm. um, here it's UBS, Swisscom, Accenture and um, all these companies they realize hey you need to focus more on the end user before you do anything so it's actually surprising that especially big corporations learn that it's important and startups um, believe they can do it themselves. Right. So.
that's a little bit inverted the, the mindset. Yeah, you, yeah. You think that the startups would be more keen on that. Yeah, but I, I understand it's not like, it's like the pricing. It, it, it's as a startup, you have to be very um, careful with money. Of course. But would you rather spend um, a thousand Swiss francs on our test users or spend 50,000 on a platform? Nobody cares, you know. So, um, and if you spend a thousand up front, you learn how you, you should build your, your, your platform and then you have a better chance to, to succeed. Mm -hmm. Um, during the course of the conversation, if anyone has a question, just raise your hand and I'll try to catch I mean, I'm looking more this way, but I'll just whistle or holler or something. And um, feel free to ask any questions as well. Yeah, first. Actually, I have a question. Um, I think I already know Taxi Time a bit, since I also followed them for, for the last years. But uh, just like your last sentence, did, the way you said, um, you invest a thousand francs and you know how to build the marketplace or like a platform. Another question is, I actually get users from you, but what I do with them, and that I, in the end, have a great test as a startup, who can kind of support me in that? Is this also yeah. something you do, or what would you like? I can support you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. <laughs> you experience. <laughs> <laughs> and customer. Like, if you would like sell this to sort of like that, then they would say, well, yes, we want to invest a thousand in a good, good test. And what is a good test? Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very good question. And we used we used to, okay, we had to make a decision. We, we want to. We are in for scale, right? And um, this is like consulting, um, and consulting is not for scale. So we really took this niche of delivering people make it highly automated with a lot of intelligent algorithm in it. This is our game. And we built now a great content marketing strategy where we kind of set us up as experts in the field so you can read a lot about how you do it, what it's important. And we can help you connect with people like Slower Club. And, and, and we have a network because a lot of our customers are experts. But what we don't want to do is getting into that um, consulting space because that will be scared. But no, absolutely not scared. So probably that's also the reason why startups will not like knock you down that often because they probably don't even have the resources or experience yet to also set up a good test. True. That's why it's always good to have UX skills in your early founding team or in the early team. Um, so then you have the expertise. So I think that's a very valuable uh, um, position to take. So many um, startups, and as they as they scale and grow, they start getting new ideas and want to implement new features. And often, the companies that have the best products are the companies that focus on one product and not on you know a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So you guys choosing to focus on delivering this very specific solution. Yes. Yes gives you, as you said, the chance to scale uh, exactly. as opposed to getting bogged down with exactly. secondary uh, priority. That will be also my second recommendation. When you start something, it's always tempting to do a consulting business because then your, your burn rate slows down. But don't believe, believe in your niche. Make it scalable. And don't go in for those few bucks you can make extra. It's not worth it. It's better you fail fast than you keep yourself alive with like this monster or whatever you end up with. Um, the question you mentioned that you want a representative user base, that you recruit the users which are not the students or the people who have a lot of time, um, the ones who you might want more, which are the, the kind of classical users. How do you motivate them to participate and, and engage them in a, on an ongoing basis? Mm -hmm. um, good question. So we identified three personas, um, which we kind of set our marketing material up for. It's, it's like, it's a student who really goes for the money. It's like the 40 plus, which is well set up in life, has like a routine. And wants some break, wants to see new things. Like, 
as an example, we had a, a, a pilot, it's, a, it's like pilot for like, I don't know, Lufthansa or, or Swiss, and he, he participated because he wants to see new things. And even if it's just like a session with any company, like to get to see behind the scenes. And then you have the third persona, which is like 60 plus people who getting closer to retirement. And those people have a lot of wisdom and they really feel good if they can give back some of what they learn through for, for, for life. And so like only the first persona really does it for the money, the others because they find it either exciting or they care. And this is how we work today. And then we introduce a lot of things, like we build the whole sign-up flow viral, so that means every test user can bring other test users, and as soon as they can participate, you earn um, money, like as a referral fee. And we have like a great dashboard where we measure every parameter, so the whole distribution of overall, um, basically, criterias. And then when we see all there, it's like jumping up too, too hard, and we try to kind of put efforts on to the other um, areas. So. Um, uh, adding another question on that, did I get you correctly that you're excluding the, the age range between 30 and 40? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, we, of course, no. We, we, I mean, it's the generation Y. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and um, what I meant is you cannot build, like, personas is a great tool in also in UX and uh, design to kind of have a model of who you want to approach. So you don't always need to, to go and find the target groups. So it's basically. Um, a great tool. And so, in order to focus discussions on typical personas, we had to identify three. And if you do like too many, then you have no fo focus. So, going back a little bit to the, the journey of, of testing time, going from the initial idea to testing a product to paying customers to where you are today, how long? How long did that take? So the sort of the MVP phase, where it was like a side project. That was like um, about a year. And then we kind of made with our really, back then, crappy system, 100,000 um, Swiss francs revenue. And it turned like big enough that we couldn't handle it as a side business anymore. And then we kind of started to um, <coughs> Going to the next phase, we open the uh, company, mm -hmm. testing time AG, yeah. and said, okay, we focus 100% on this now. And when, when did you think, start thinking about funding? That was one of the premises when we actually um, founded the company. We will do it because we also want to raise a seed round as the next step. That was all in 2015, mm -hmm. and and of course um, we already like tried to find like interested investors before we found the button. We said, okay, let's just go all in. It's maybe even better if you already have a company set up to show commitment mm -hmm. and 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 it's still um, it was a lengthy process, but eventually it turned out well, mm -hmm. and then we could scale up. We could scale up the team really. Um, Prove with that money that we can. One of the main premise was we can grow outside Switzerland, so we're not just like a nice Swiss case. We can really um, conquer Germany, UK. And you mentioned about your your former startup uh, attempt, where you couldn't find a co-founder in the case of testing time. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was initially yours, and then you found someone to collaborate with you, or was it a co-creation? How? For, for for testing the, time. Of a, no, that was because like we remember the name. I couldn't find anyone, and I still went ahead. And and my, when I said okay, I want to try this out, and I, I promised myself I don't do it without having at least one co-founder join. Mm -hmm. Same skin so in the game. So you strongly believe that uh, there should always be at least one co-founder. Yeah. it's like um, have you heard of 
with Fermi paradox, but with the great filters of of human kind have to go through filters. So with startups, it's the same. I just had a long talk yesterday with a single founder, and I, and I told him like you should have a priority find a co-founder because finding a co-founder is first validation that you are on something good because if you cannot convince anyone to join it may be not a strong thing so um, and i think co-founder always should be there and, and i know i have been there i have done things alone and kept believing and believing um, <laughs> And it's also more fun to eat the cake with other people than alone. <laughs> and if you remember the name, it was at the end, no cake. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so there was a yeah, question. Sorry. Um, I'm just struggling a bit with the final product, actually, the service you offer. In the end, what does the customer get? Does he get a, a report or what is the final? Just people. Okay, but then he can can I ask from them. Uh, I mean, they, they fill out. Uh, I mean, they just fill it out, and then he. he so, can so your client, form. your client creates the usability test. Yes. So oh, okay. as an ex as example, UX designers oh, yeah. they okay. build the prototype. Yeah. Um, they want to know whether this prototype works. Okay. Do people get it before we start developing it? So now you can go around and ask. Your mom, your friends, they always say, oh, it's yeah, great, okay. so they're, off, they're biased. <laughs> but with us, you can get people you want to build this product for. Okay, you get the people, not the standardized procedure uh, for testing. You, what, what no, you we, from we, we build know-how around it, okay, you can okay. read about but we don't do it. We okay. stay out of the, we stay out of the tooling thing. There are so many tools to build okay. prototypes and record tests and all that. We really just deliver just people. people. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the question, I, I understand how you stay lean on the market side, finding customers, you made a mock-up homepage basically, mm -hmm. but how did you stay lean on the other part of the business, recruiting uh, the testers, because I think that's really tricky, how do you, how do you find 100,000 people? Yeah. I remember I remember the first the very first order um, which was really paid by credit card and it was from Cinetto um, design agency in Zurich. I was like, yes, but what are you going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> because I remember he posted, I'm, I'm looking for test users, I commented to him, hey, try this. And so he ordered, and then he ended up doing the same, <laughs> posting again on Facebook, <laughs> trying to find. So, um, but then we said, look, we cannot handle this, we cannot post on Facebook, that's not where we want to, um, where we're aiming for. So, we also knew it's going to take time to build up a pool, and then we kind of found a great um, workaround. It was back in Stuff Finder, today they are called Poopool. So we basically were like, the, the, we got an order and we sent the order to Stuff Finder, and all we did was like um, screening those people, but the pool was Stuff Finder. And we also knew we cannot really go on with that for too long because um, Stuff Finder has a very specific crowd, it's not representative at all. And then so we decided, okay, we need to professionalize this thing. And, um, and then we started to really um, build sign up pages, make it really easy to go introduce the referral mechanism, start to run campaigns in different places. And now this. 11th person we just hired, he's like a professional in that area. He has done this all live for for other customers and now we got him into our boat to make sure we always get enough signups from all around. And how does it work that you also keep your testers busy? Because isn't that also a negative experience if I show if I sign up for testing and then for months there's nobody yeah. who test me? That's really a challenge. Um, it's like pool engagement, and you get a lot of complaints. I sign up, I haven't heard from you, what's wrong? Then you say, okay, you are, um, I don't know, you're in an area where we don't have a lot of things. Like in the US, you have like 
like 10,000 people sign up from the US and you, you don't you have a few US customers but it's not like at the moment main market so people get restless and you have to find a way to engage people otherwise um, they get pissed and they delete themselves so they talk start to talk bad about us and that way it's like a partnership to kind of um, use the pool in other ways and um, we are looking into those options but I mean the ulti ultimate thing is to find enough customers yeah. everywhere to you know to shake this thing up the whole ecosystem that's the number one priority so all every startup every founder you know they're always looking for to land that first big client how did you who was your or how did you land your first big client that was actually Especially, well, especially when you're when you're a small yeah. fish and you're approaching a corporate, yeah. you have no background, no track record. So, I people are or are, are still amazed. Like we have really big corporations. I mean, our our slide and the pitch that looks really beautiful because we have really all these logos now. Also, Google here in, in, in Missouri, in Microsoft, and I mean, we have all these beautiful clients and. For one thing, we solve a real problem. That's why they come. And these big companies, they set up new, fresh, modern UX teams. So, but back then, when we were no one, I I realized that they did a great thing during my second studies. And when I studied um, interaction design, I, I did it sort of, I don't know whether it was for purpose, but I did it vice versa. So, I started with the second year, with the first year, and then I did my master thesis. Um, so I, I met three different classes, and so, like you, the class was like about thirty people, but I, because I did everything vice versa, I met like ninety to hundred people, all potential customers, and so these people they all work in these big corporations, and so that was an easy start to get um, into those corporations mm -hmm. and I kind of realized this afterwards that was a great thing so if you do like um, <laughs> so all you do is do it um, <laughs> the other way around it's a network at the end this is how you get started but then you also realize um, it doesn't scale well you cannot like do studies and meet people so you can also network but it doesn't scale so that's why we started to develop um, our inbound marketing strategy to to really go way beyond our personal network. And this is how we grow now the strongest today, our inbound approach. And what's the best uh, advice you've received uh, as, a, uh, as a startup founder? So like from a mentor or from, from someone else? Yeah, but best advice, startup advice you've received? Um, there were, I think, with my Cadoodle, that was like a great, I fought a lot with him, you know, we were sort of two alpha um, people, but um, it was really great because he taught me to stay, like, focused on one thing. I mean, he was the master of killing things, so <laughs> dry down killing. He always had, like, a to-do list, um, a, it's called kiss, um, um, like what can we kill? Kiss to death, you know. We always move to do's in there, and so this this mindset, not not don't always think about what can we do next. Also, what what, what can we get rid of is equally important to stay focused. And that was great. And I read Elon Musk. It may sound cheesy now, but um, in there. A lot of great things, how to be tough and don't always try to try to be nice and make everyone like feel um, this have a clear path and sometimes you have to make tough decisions right. and so he's also the master in that, you know, and and the reading that the book was, was great and helpful for me. And what's the worst advice you received? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question. 
the worst of lies. <laughs> um, I think there's no such thing. People always try to help. So everyone has an idea. I talk with many people tonight already, and everyone has an idea. And I think I tend to sometimes, I always suck it up, and I think there's always a truth and something. But sometimes you also need to learn to, to take this as a feedback, but don't act on it. And sometimes I feel like act too much on feedback and try out different things rather than trust your gut and say thank you for the advice, but I believe I don't need to do anything or act on it. So it's more like, yeah, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. But like, no advice is, it's really bad. Um, I think people always say, some people say don't take in fundings, um, it's never good. Your cap table and you lose control and all these things and even there like it's not about money and 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 because it's about partnering up with someone to grow faster and and develop a bigger story and 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 even like it's like you don't even need to own it after the several runs and fifty percent because most of the decisions are based on two third or even more percent of your company and right. like and it's like. All these things aren't so important. Mm. Are, don't be afraid to lose control. Um, um, yeah? Um, actually, I would be interested in how can you balance, for instance, on one side you manage people, your team, on the other side you have clear ideas, vision, you know what you want inside. And how do you actually make your team feel also important? Because you know how to say you get lots of input, lots of ideas all the time, which is great. Mm -hmm. But if you know what you want, you go for that. And how do you give your team the, the feeling, hey, it do matter? Maybe even though he doesn't take my advice, he doesn't listen to me, like how do you keep them motivated to kind of change your game as well? To to change your game? Whatever answer you give now, <laughs> because some of the people are here, <laughs> I will hear the feedback tomorrow. Um, um, <laughs> very good, very good question. And I guess it starts with having a great co-founder who challenges you all the time. It's up there. Um, <laughs> um, he is responsible for the HR department. <laughs> so, so you shifted over to <laughs> <laughs> <It's> my problem. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I cannot give you a bulletproof answer here, but what I want to see is that people are passionate about what they do. You feel this, this is the energy. And as long as I feel everyone in here is excited to come in and, and build something great, I think that it's all good and we do a great job from, um, from, from sort of as founders. And, and sometimes, yeah, there are things which, which are also part, like if you're a small team, you also have to do a lot of crap. And I always try to lead by example, I also do crappy things. And I say, look, I also do it. So um, also um, take some of it, but um, lead by example, I guess. So not just for crappy things, also for good things, and uh, inspire people. And and sometimes I learned this a lot over the past year. When when you are very small or only founders, it's your baby, and then you have to let go. And at the beginning, you always want to. Give your advice, and, 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 and you know certain things you would do different, and you need to learn to let go. Yeah. That was very hard for me. And as soon as you can let go and say, Look, I trust you, you are the expert in what you do, and I can give you advice if you want it, but don't impose it. Then you give like responsibility away, and this is what people really like. That um, Everyone. Yes, <laughs> yeah. but it's not easy. Yeah. I had to learn this to let go, um, because as a founder, you're such a generalist. You are pretty good in many things, 
you're nowhere really an expert, and you always believe you're still good, but you realize at this point, no, actually each one you hire, you want to look up in, in, in a certain ex expertise. Because you want to learn as well, right? Exactly. You want to be surrounded by exactly. Yeah. I, I, I want to be inspired by what they do, and, and yeah, you hire experts in certain things, you don't need too many generalists anymore, that's what founders do. And you all let go, trust people, it always turns out well. And, and also yeah. share. Share. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like every employee has shares or options or fatness stock options or whatever you want to call it. It has, has some fatness stock options. So it's also everybody is rolling in, in his own boat kind of to the direction, which is kind of like very important also a lot to two of us. As everybody like really being in the you know, being somewhere around the world. That's it true. And we decided that from the very beginning, everyone who joins gets options, and then we get more options. So, so speaking of, of options, uh, you have an exit strategy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's often a topic. Many many people, you know, want, you know think or that uh, you know, come from different different angles. They. You know, as a startup and you're building the first few years, focus on your product and then you think about an exit and other people think, well, in the beginning you should have an exit strategy. Right? Well, first of all, if you want to get investors, you always need to have an exit plan. Um, so, we have like a five year scope. Um, in about three years, we want to bring this baby to a place where we are really attractive for uh, a big market research company who realized, whoa, we kind of lost um, <laughs> um, track here and we need to really speed up things again to be competitive. They could purchase us. Right. Um, of course, we want to become a, a fast growing and world dominating company in this space. Um, we want to be like the market leader. And, but also as founders, I think there's a certain time where you kind of are done with it. Whether it goes on as, as like a proper big setup company, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Of course, we want to try to achieve an exit at some point. It has to be meaningful, otherwise you wouldn't do it. Um, but I think there is like a time you're done as a founder. And, there are a few exceptions which, yeah, you can go till IPO and make it really big. What we don't want is just to stay like a car move and, and make a nice way of living. I think that's not the game in. we sign up for, yeah. Okay. yeah. And um, what is a mistake that you would want uh, other fellow entrepreneurs to avoid? Um, I think I said, like, don't found yourself. Uh, I mean, find a co founder, but also be selective. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a double, it's a, it, it's a double challenge. And back then, when we started, I remember we just needed a coder. Um, it was before, and um, only joined just to get this platform running. And you just kind of get someone on board. Yeah, you're also founder, or um, so like. And we didn't really think about the legal things. And suddenly realized this is not going to work with this person. Um, you need to kind of untie it. And you try to make it fair, but if people realize they're going to lose something, then they get very um, tough on you. So be picky who you're going to marry to. And you don't need to not go to a lawyer and make a clear baseline. It's just like when you get married, I never got married, but uh, I always hear um, when you get married, talk about the, the bad things in good times. So what if it's not going to work out? So really write this down, have it signed, set the baseline, and then both can, can go in with 
best uh, preconditions to make it work, but sometimes things don't work out, and then you don't have fights because you never talked about separation, and it's worth to have a clean baseline when everything is still great and honeymoon. Um, if you could do it over again, what would, would you do something different? Um, I kind of like the journey <laughs> so far. I mean, everything has come together as a, as a beautiful story I'm personally very proud of. Um, I think no, the whole the whole setup of the company. Maybe people think should I jump both early full time? Like, is it really necessary to do it like 1.5 years on the side as a project because the kind of is intense? It's even more intense afterwards. But do you think that if you had started a year earlier, because often that's another challenge with startup space, is that they're too early to the market and then it doesn't work out, and two or three years later someone else comes with the same idea. And, yeah. You know. So do you think that it could have been successful a year earlier? Um, it could have, but I think we are in the perfect time because now competition comes up. They are where we were two years ago. And that validates your idea. Yes, that's another validation. And I think I will try to be even more aggressive, you know, it's like, um, can, we, can we go faster? <laughs> we always try to go faster, and, and, but then things take also natural flow. You cannot force investors to come on earlier, you need to convince. Um, I think also what I did right is, I'm not a salesperson. And I realized someone has to do sales early on, and so I pulled the card. So um, I was a salesman at the beginning, and I had no clue how to do this. And and and, and uh, I took a course, a great course or a class. It was like a five days class um, with sales generator. You know, also around here, and then going on sales tours and everything. I mean. That was the greatest thing I could do. You learn so much about your space, about what you custom to really want. Now today I don't go so often anymore, but I could no, I did this also the right time. Um, I couldn't have done it earlier and yeah. I can talk more about <laughs> things I advised and <laughs> what it would change. What, uh, was there a was they was there a particular or a significant failure in this journey, uh, or a significant setback uh, that you guys faced, or that you personally faced, and how did you uh, bounce back from that? Um, I think early on, when we tried to go abroad, um, there were like the first first orders in, in, in a, I remember in Amsterdam, went horribly, I mean, that customer was had the first experience because we were, yeah, we, we, we felt like it's, we can do it and we weren't ready and we don't know how people are in, 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 in those cities. And so this doesn't really help them for your reputation, you lose the customer and these things. So um, at, at a certain maturity, you need to be careful not to be like too too daring. Uh, you need to, you need to remain a, a professionality, and it's better than to say no, we aren't ready yet, but let us get ready, and, and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So we have time for one last question, and then we need to wrap up. So going back to inbound marketing, you mentioned that was providing a lot of leads nowadays. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Like, what have you tried that worked well? What have you tried that didn't work well in terms of inbound marketing? Um, the expert is here. He can talk to you um, afterwards. Um, also there, um, we called in, I mean, besides Sandra, which is a professional online marketing manager, um, we pulled in a Burnley agency to um, educate us um, back then how to do it, what's the right approach for a, a good content strategy. And then it's all about measuring 
really measure every goddamn thing you can do and, 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 and optimize things. And for me, like about a third of the team now writes content. And we're going to have a blog relaunch this week, next week, Thursday. Thursday. And so I think it's important that you don't recycle too much, write authentic, honest content, your own expert, and, and, and yeah, um, writing is a big part of the startup journey, and yeah, be authentic. So to wrap up, there's a, a few short questions we ask all of the founders who uh, participate with us in the startup brand, and the idea is for you to give the first answer that comes to your mind. <laughs> but I have to understand the question. So there's there's like five or six questions, and uh, it's just it's like a rapid fire. Uh, Let me sip a. some water. <laughs> But they're not hard. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, what is what is one item that you own that you would never sell? <laughs> My music instruments. What is your most unusual skill? Um, Swiss folk music, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> What's more important, strength, speed, or stamina? Um, what means the word stamina? Uh, endurance. Aha. Uh -huh. Stamina. What historical figure do you most admire? Which? What historical figure, person from history that you most admire? <laughs> <You're a> <laughs> what is your favorite season of the year? Um, that's spring. When was the last time that you tried something new? <laughs> uh, today. <laughs> Doing startup prime. <laughs> Cats or dogs? Cats. Beer or wine? Beer. What's your favorite app? Besides Tim. <laughs> um, but who no. <laughs> uh, my favorite app is Google Maps. What's one thing on your bucket list? Um, go back to San Francisco for a vacation. It's been too long. And if you could have the attribute of any animal, what would you choose? What animal would you like to be? I would be. <laughs> what do you see in me? <laughs> um, the gay part. Um, uh, leopard. Leopard, fast. Leopard. Cheetah. 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 Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Matthew, for your, for your uh, feedback and your insights tonight, for sharing your story with us. It was very insightful. Um, you're still around for a little bit. Sure. So we have a little bit more of networking. Um, but thank you once again for joining us tonight. Um, uh, I found it very fascinating, very interesting, and I'm sure everyone else uh, had a uh, very good learning experience as well. Thank you.